perhaps we should start. Uh, it's a very special pleasure uh, to welcome uh, today's speaker, uh, Mark Mayandowski from Johns Hopkins University. Mark has had a, a very distinguished career in physics so far. Uh, he graduated, uh, he got his PhD from the University of Chicago, spent uh, a few years at, at Princeton as a, as a postdoc, and then moved as a faculty member in Columbia, relocating after that to Caltech, where he was a, a Robinson professor of physics. Uh, and helped to create a more uh, uh, theoretical cosmology institute uh, at Caltech, an extremely successful enterprise. Uh, after that, he moved to Baltimore, uh, to Johns Hopkins University, and to my question why he did so, he answered, you can never be happier than your wife, which had a profound influence on, on my personal life as well as my wife. <laughs> uh, but uh, he is uh, at Johns Hopkins, uh, created and established a wonderful theory uh, group over there, out of which you know some, some already some great students came out. Uh, Mark is, uh, uh, is is well known for his work on fundamental questions in cosmology. He just named dark matter, dark energy, cosmic radiation, gravitational waves. These are all subjects for cosmology that he, he has made. His uh, uh, very important imprints. But speaking of imprints, he is best known. Uh, for teaching us how to do cosmic archaeology, namely the fact that if we measure very precisely cosmic mi mi micro background uh, anisotropies, then we'll be able to deduce a lot about the past of the universe. And for that work and, and you know, many others, he was awarded this year the Heinemann Prize. Uh, he's a member of the uh, uh, National Academy of Arts and Science, uh, and I'm very pleased to welcome him uh, today. So he's going to tell us about, uh, it's about cosmology, but it's about the biggest part of that curve, as I understand, that the talk is going to be. That's the only slide. This is basically it. This is the first slide, this is the last slide, and I use it two or three more times as well. So when I agreed to give this talk, I was going to talk about other work. Um, but then, at the time that I was uh, requested to actually send the abstract and title already, please send the abstract and title already, um, I decided to change my mind. and. I gave a similar talk at Ohio State University last week, um, and hopefully this will be better than that. <laughs> um, well, one of the Ohio State. Yeah, it was the Ohio State University. So, the title is There's Room at the Bottom, New Avenues to the Early Universe. And, um, roughly speaking, the first half of the talk will be an overview of what we do in cosmology and why we believe it's interesting. And the second half of the talk will be a bunch of crazy ideas for things that we might someday um, be able to do in the future um, to learn more about um, the early universe. So I'm going to start by telling you about the matter power spectrum. So the matter power spectrum is, measurement of the matter power spectrum employs, I would say, a very significant fraction of the people working in cosmology today. The basic idea is that we live in a universe that has a bunch of galaxies. So as you know, we live on planet Earth. The Earth spins around the sun. The sun is one of billions of stars in a galaxy called the Milky Way. The sun spins around, the solar system spins around the center of the Milky Way, but it turns out that our Milky Way, our collection of several billion stars, is just one of billions of similar galaxies spread throughout the universe. And this is a, an n-body simulation, a cosmo, uh, com a computer simulation of how we believe the galaxies in the universe are distributed. And as far as we know, this picture is consistent with observations. We now have um, galaxy surveys that measure the positions of millions of these galaxies. Several of these, um, we're now in you know, the third decade of such galaxy surveys. And as far as we can tell, the simulation accords well with what we see. How big is that box? Oh. How big is the screen? It's less than that. <laughs> How much? That looks like what cross makes, so it's 80 megaparsecs. 80 megaparsecs, that sounds about right. So the typical space in between galaxies is about a megaparsec. So roughly speaking, there are, you know, you've got 100 galaxies across, so 100 megaparsec is not an unreasonable number. So if by, by, by degrees, you mean like the, the distribution by some correlation function? I'm going to, pre I'm going to quantify that much more precisely. So, the matter power spectrum is the following. So, from this distribution of galaxies, you have a map 
of the matter density, rho, as a function of position, x in the universe. And from that, you can do a subtraction and a division. This is within the abilities of most um, people in cosmology. (laughs) And then you construct this other quantity, delta. Delta is the fractional density perturbation. It's the the density at position x minus the mean density, rho bar, divided by the mean density. And then you do a slightly more complicated mathematical operation. You do a Fourier transform. So you take this delta of x, and you construct from it the Fourier coefficients delta of k. So specification of these Fourier coefficients is identical to specification of delta of x. And then there's the power spectrum. The power spectrum, the thing that I'm going to talk about in this talk, is P of k. And it is the expectation value for the square of the Fourier coefficients k. So P of k depends on the magnitude k. It does not have a little hat, on, a little vector on top of it. And that is an assumption of statistical isotropy or the notion that there's no preferred direction in the universe. If I have a Fourier mode pointing in this particular direction with some particular wave number, it is expected to have the same amplitude on average squared as a Fourier mode pointing in some other direction. And so P of k is the variance of the fractional density perturbation for a wave number of um, wave number k. What is, what is this average? Ah, I'll get to that in a second. So, so here the average is over all modes. It's either um, it's either an average over all modes that have um, all vectors k that have an amplitude equal to k or it's a, an average over all universes. As I will explain in a few slides, um, there's a prediction from the, the, our, early universe prediction, our early universe theories make predictions for the mean squared delta, delta sub k squared over all universes. But up to now, this is experimentally. I'll get to that. Okay. I think that's my next slide. So... This is the way we measure it. It's straightforward to measure. So we take this galaxy survey. We take the Fourier amplitudes, delta sub k, that we've measured. And then we take all Fourier modes k that have a wave number or magnitude close to the value k for which we're trying to measure the power spectrum. And then we take the average value, delta k squared, for all such modes. So it's, of course, an imperfect measurement. There's going to be some error involved because for any specific value of k or some range of values of k, there are only going to be a finite number of modes within that box. And so there's what we call a cosmic variance involved in the measurement. And so no matter how well we do with the measurement, there's always going to be some finite error bar. But it turns out that for the wavelengths that we're interested in, we can actually measure this quite precisely and that cosmic variance is not a limiting factor. We can measure this power spectrum not only from galaxy surveys, but we can also measure it with the cosmic microwave background. So it turns out that when we look out in the universe with um, at radio or microwave frequencies, frequencies around 100 gigahertz, the entire night sky glows. The entire sky glows, and it glows with a, um, with a black body spectrum that has a temperature of 2.7 K. And that black body intensity is the same in all directions on the sky up to, fa- up to roughly a par- uh, one part in 100,000. So these color contrasts represent differences in the intensity from one point in the sky to another of roughly one part in 100,000. And the measurements are now done. The most recent is from the European Space Agency's Planck satellite, which has an angular resolution of about five arc minutes. So right now the measurements are, um, the resolution is so precise that we actually have the intensity on tens of millions of different points, directions on the sky. So it's a huge and very precise data set. When we look at this cosmic microwave background, we have very good reason to believe that it originates on a spherical surface that's 13.8 billion light years away. So we know that the universe is expanding today. We measure its expansion rate. We run the expansion back in time. And we can infer that there was a Big Bang about 13.8 billion years ago. Nothing travels faster than the speed of light, and so the largest distance that we can see is 13.8 billion light years. And so that cosmic microwave background map that we see actually maps the temperature of the universe 
as it was 400,000 years after the Big Bang. Actually, this would be years, not light years. 400,000 years after the Big Bang. So this is a snapshot of the temperature of the primordial plasma as it was on a spherical surface of radius 13.8 billion light years. And we see it as it was when the universe was 400,000 years old. So we're not measuring the three-dimensional... Well, I should also say, if there's one more thing I should say, um, we measure a temperature fluctuation. We have very good reason to believe that when we measure the temperature in some given point on the sky, that temperature fluctuation arises from the redshift of a photon as it climbs out of a gravitational potential well. So we believe, and have very good reason to believe, that these intensity fluctuations actually measure matter perturbations perturbations to the total matter density on the spherical surface. So with the cosmic microwave background, we don't measure the three-dimensional distribution of mass, but we measure the distribution of mass on this two-dimensional spherical surface. So it's not that that spot was hotter or colder for a, you know, 13.4 billion years ago. It was that that spot was slightly more massive, and so it got redshifted the way out. It depends on the gauge. <clears throat> So in general, it's a, so to actually do this properly, this is a, an intrinsically general relativistic problem. Whether it's intrinsically hotter or colder depends on which gauge you, you choose. So I can choose coordinates in which there are actual temperature differences, and then there are other coordinates I can choose in which um, that temperature fluctuation arises as a fact that I'm seeing these things at a different time. But the matter is gauge sensitive. The observable is, is uh, independent, gauge independent. But the description is, you know, whether I say it's an actual, whether the, the gas that's emitting that photon is hotter um, or colder, that question depends on, um, on uh, the gauge I choose. The local mass. So let me, let, me, let, me, let me answer this a little better. Um, if I go to, an, if, I were, if I was a co-moving observer, moving with the plasma at this point on the surface of last scatter, I would say, there go my photons. At that time, the temperature will be the same. All these people will tell you they have the same temperature. And it's roughly an electron volt. But the mass density you're saying is gauge independent? What you call the mass perturbation is gauge dependent. All of the things I will tell you are gauge independent, so let's move on from gauge discussions to the rest of the story. Ugh. I've taught general relativity several times and it's one of these subjects that no matter how many times you teach it when you go into class to teach you really have to think <laughs> you know classical mechanics Lagrangian mechanics you go up there Lagrangian T minus V you do this little uh, variational thing you get Euler Lagrange that's it you don't have to prepare anytime I teach general relativity no matter how many times I teach it I have to think when I go in the classroom so let's not, let's not go there <laughs> <laughs> so, with the cosmic microwave background, we measure the distribution of matter on this two-dimensional surface, the spherical surface. The way we do this quantitatively is similar to what we, we do with a galaxy survey. We take the temperature, and from the temperature map, we construct the spherical harmonic coefficients, the coefficients in the spherical harmonic expansion. This is a, identical to a, a two-dimensional Fourier transform, but it's a two-dimensional Fourier transform on a spherical surface. And we construct these quantities ALM, which are equivalent or analogous to the delta sub Ks, the Fourier amplitudes. And then we construct a cosmic microwave background um, power spectrum, C sub L, which is analogous to P of K. It's just um, the power spectrum on that two-dimensional spherical surface. And we construct it in a, in a manner analogous to what we do for galaxy surveys. And we can do this, and we can do it remarkably well. I'll show you some data that are extraordinarily precise. There's a subtle difference. When we measure the distribution of matter with galaxy surveys, we're measuring the distribution of mass in the universe today. When we measure the distribution of mass with cosmic microwave background measurements, we're measuring it early times, when the universe was 400,000 years old as opposed to 14 billion years old. But we know how to relate the distribution of matter in the early universe to the distribution of matter today, and it's a subject called cosmological perturbation theory. Um, Roman Scacciamaro is one of the world experts on this and it's straightforward, and everyone can do it in their own room and come back and get the same answers. So that's very easy. So the two measurements are comparable. 
And when we combine them, they look like this. And this is actually a little bit out of date. And what you see is that there is a theoretical curve that fits very well with the data. So this is that cosmic variance. These large error bars on the left-hand side over here are that cosmic variance that I told you about. On large scales, there are very few, few Fourier modes. But when we get to smaller scales, we have many more Fourier modes. The cosmic variance becomes smaller, and the error bars become very small. And so we infer that um, the measurement of the distribution of mass in the universe is consistent with the power spectrum that has this very simple, smooth structure, which, as I will explain shortly, is a prediction of um, early universe theories. And we measure the agreement of the theory with the measurements is very, very good over two to three orders of magnitude. So wave numbers less than 0.01 to wave numbers greater than 0.1, where the wave number k which corresponds to an inverse distance, these are the distances, um, is somewhere between 10 megaparsecs to 1,000 megaparsecs. Remember, a megaparsec is 3 times 10 to the 24th um, centimeters. It's um, 3 million light years. But in more prosaic terms, it's, as I said, roughly speaking, the typical spacing between galaxies. So we've measured this power spectrum very precisely from distances comparable to the typical spacing between galaxies, or a little bit bigger than that spacing, all the way up to the largest observable um, distances in the universe, several thousands of megaparsecs. So this is great. We can be very proud of ourselves. Um, people in this room, Mike Blanton and David Hogg, have contributed very significantly to this enterprise. So the power spectrum that I just showed you, strictly speaking, as I said, is uh, the matter power spectrum in the universe today. And from the matter power spectrum in the universe today, we can use cosmological perturbation theory to um, relate it to a power spectrum in the early universe. It goes up, it goes down. The thing that I'm showing you is actually what we call a processed power spectrum. The processed power spectrum, the power spectrum in the universe today, this P of, is this, uh, P of K times T of K squared, it is related to the power spectrum, the matter power spectrum, in the very early universe through this thing called a transfer function, T of K. This is a product of cosmological perturbation theory. It's straightforward to calculate. And if we remove this T of K, then this function, which goes up and then goes down, turns out to be extremely consistent with a power law, a pure power law. So our measurements tell us that the distribution of matter in the early universe has a power spectrum that's very, very consistent with the pure power law over roughly three decades in distance scale. And now here's the reason why we care about this. The reason why we care, why we're interested to measure the matter, matter power spectrum, is that our theories for the origin of the universe make predictions for what this power spectrum should be. And in particular, we have one idea that's the prevailing paradigm in cosmology today, um, because after 30, 30 some five years after it was proposed, all of the comp competing explanations um, have sort of fallen by the wayside. Inflation, which uh, is a period of super accelerated expansion in the very early universe, perhaps a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang, it involves highly speculative, extremely high energy physics, which we have no knowledge of, don't understand. But it's a very simple Toy, a very simple toy model for this uh, idea of inflation predicts that the primordial power spectrum that we measure should be a power law, k to some power law index n sub s. And inflation, moreover, makes two predictions. It predicts that n sub s should be very close to 1, but it also predicts that n sub s should very precisely be different than 1. So what we do in inflation... Sorry? Oh. Yeah, that's, uh, that's here. So um, I'm actually skipping ahead a few slides because uh, I forgot to put the slide I wanted in there. So inflation, in order to do what it's supposed to do, inflation postulates the existence of some new scalar field, which we call phi. It could be a Higgs field associated with grand unification. It could be a Higgs field associated with electroweak theory, although probably not. It might be involved with supersymmetry breaking. It might have something to do with Petri Quinn symmetry breaking. It might have something to do with, super th um, with um, string theory, quantum gravity. We don't know. All we do is postulate some scalar field phi, and we postulate that at some point in the early history of the universe, the energy density of the universe was dominated 
by the vacuum energy, potential energy associated with the, um, the, the displacement of the scalar field from the minimum of its potential. So if you postulate there's a scalar field that has a potential that looks either like this or like this or anything else, these are just two cartoonish models, then if the scalar field is displaced from the minimum of its, of its potential, then you can show that inflation occurs. You will get a nearly scale invariant spectrum of primordial density perturbations. And you can also show that those primordial perturbations will have a matter power spectrum that is not exactly, but is very well approximated by a power law with a spectral index n sub s, which is 1 minus 2 epsilon plus 6 eta, where epsilon is related to the first derivative of that potential, and eta is related to the second derivative of that potential. So in other words, when we measure the matter power spectrum P of k, we're actually learning something about the functional dependence of this potential energy density on the scalar field responsible for inflation. Yep? But, but when you talk about the first and second derivative, where? Where? Ah, that's the next... Uh, you guys are asking such good questions. Actually, what I should do is stop at every slide and wait for the next question, because here's the answer. So, in early times, the, thing, the scalar field is up here, and then it slowly rolls towards the minimum. So it turns out that the V and V prime for the largest scales, the lowest Ks, come from the earliest times. So this side of the matter power spectrum comes from the scalar field being up here. And as we go to the right, we measure V and V prime further and further down. Okay? So strictly speaking, this part of the power spectrum measures V and V prime over here. This part of the power spectrum measures V and V prime over here. The reason why it's usually well approximated by a power law is that the inflaton generally moves a region that's fairly small. But strictly speaking, V of phi... P of K measures V of phi. So, so that tells us if we calculate like what that V of phi is. That's right. We can invert it. We can take this measurement and go like this. As you'll see in a second, the measurements are very consistent with the power law, from which we can't really infer much about the detailed functional dependence apart from, roughly speaking, V and V prime in some local region over here. And we can also infer that that inflaton potential is relatively smooth. It doesn't have wild features which is what we would have expected. So this is great. We've measured the matter. Oh, I forgot to tell you. I forgot to, sorry, I skipped ahead two slides. So this is a very significant thing. So inflation predicts that N sub S is close to 1, but it differs from 1. So epsilon and eta are related to V, and v prime and V double prime. In theoretical models that allow inflation to work, they're expected to, to be small. So they're related to V prime and V double prime, but they're typically numbers that are small, maybe a tenth, a hundredth, and some models they can be 10 to the minus you know, 12. But they're small parameters. They can't be one or order unity, or else the theory doesn't work. So again, inflation predicts that N sub S should be close to one, but not exactly equal to one. So measurements that were done, I would say up to about 10 years ago, told us that N sub S was very close to one. We've known for at least a decade that N sub S was very close to one. Over the past um, four or five years, it's become increasingly apparent and most, um, most robustly with um, recent results from the Planck satellite. N sub S has now been measured to be 0 0.968 plus or minus 0 0.006. The number is not important. What's important is that we've now measured the spe scalar spectral index to be different from 1 at the 5 signal level. And to me, this is the most important result to come out of the Planck satellite the past few years. Before the theory of inflation, people postulate you might have a scale invariant spectrum with density perturbations, and the power law index that people would typically guess is 1. Why not? It's scale invariant. Inflation, though, predicted it should be close to 1, but not precisely equal to 1. And the fact that it's now been measured to be precisely not equal to 1, I think, is a, is a very significant result. Yep. Suppose you found 1, would that invalidate the inflation? No, it wouldn't invalidate it. Um, we will add it. <laughs> no, it's not, no, it's, no, it's not a wiggle out. Remember, I said N sub S, I said it's close to 1. I said epsilon and eta are smallish parameters. And I said they could be, you know, some theories at 0 0.1, some theories 10 to the minus 2, some theories 10 to the minus 6. So had we had a N sub S consistent with 1, we would have said, well, we don't really know. Now that we found that N sub S is different than 1, it's information. 
Is there a way to vote? Um, yes. I'm not going to go there, though, today. I can explain afterwards if you'd like. So, this is great. We're learning something about the infoton potential for measurements of these matter power spectrum. The question now is we've measured the power spectrum. We've shown that it's very close to power law. We've measured the spe spectral index. What more can we do? So that is the subject of the rest of this talk. Before I go on to the rest of the talk, I want to discuss very briefly the question of how long inflation lasted, because this is important. So one thing that people study in inflationary model building is the number of e-folds of inflation. So by how many e-folds did the universe expand during inflation, e to the n? I'll actually define it in the next slide. Put another way, during inflation, we have this accelerated cosmological expansion. After inflation, the universe undergoes decelerated cosmological expansion when the universe is dominated by radiation or matter. And then, to our surprise, back in 1998, we found that the universe today is once again undergoing an accelerated expansion, which is not shown on this plot. But what happens is that we have a um, co-moving horizon. Roughly speaking, the expansion of the universe is described by an expansion rate. And the inverse of that expansion rate sets a distance scale over which causal physics can occur. And here I say causal physics quite loosely. And if I then look at some co-moving distance scale in the universe relative to that horizon, sorry, that co-moving distance scale, it actually becomes larger than the horizon. And at first, at early times, it's some smaller than the horizon. At some point, it exits the horizon. And then at some point, inflation ends. And then at some point, that co-moving distance scale re-enters the horizon. So when I look at a specific Fourier mode of the density field in the universe today, so for example, one that's comparable to the observable horizon today, that scale has entered the horizon recently. When I look at the lowest k, but it was also the first to exit the horizon during inflation. And I actually told you this before. Remember I told you that the left-hand side of P of K, low K, I told you that low K came from early times and high K came from later times. So the universe, um, a, a given distance scale exits the horizon at some point, inflation goes on, and then at some point this co-moving horizon grows relative to a given co-moving Fourier mode, and then re-enters. And you can ask, how long did this period of inflation occur? So that is a question that different inflation models make predictions for. And we quantify that, as I said, by the number of e-folds of inflation. So this number of e-folds of inflation is the logarithm, the natural logarithm, of the Hubble distance today, the largest distance that we can see, divided by the Hubble distance at the end of inflation. So this is typically something that's very, very small in inflationary models, and this is something that's quite big. And in typical inflationary models, and people construct all kinds of different models with all kinds of different predictions, this number turns out to be somewhere between 40 and 60, or roughly 15 to 22 decades in parameter space. And the, reason, the way we get this number is by surmising that inflation, at the end of inflation, the universe reheats to a temperature of a TeV, which is sort of the smallest possible bound, um, all the way up to 10 to the 16th GeV. And we actually know from cosmic microwave background measurements that it can't get any bigger than 10 to the 16th GeV. So the most generous range of inflationary models allows for N to be as small as 40 or as big as 60-ish um, or so, or 15 of 22 decades. And this slide is somewhat irrelevant, but um, there are a few experts, and I just wanted to advertise for them um, some recent work um, by a graduate student, Liang Dai, and a postdoc, Jun Pu, who was actually a graduate student up the street at Columbia University, and a subsequent paper with a graduate student, Julian Munoz, at Johns Hopkins, and also some sometime collaborators, sometime competitors at Arizona State University. And there's a lot of information here. The point of this work that we did was to show that measurements of N sub S, which we now have with some precision, now actually constrain the number of e-folds of inflation within the context of various fairly large classes of inflationary models. 
And the result is that we can now actually say with a bit more precision what those limits are between, that those limits are between 40 and 60. So the inflationary prediction for the matter power spectrum is therefore the slide that I start out with. So the measurements that we have for the matter power spectrum extend over roughly three decades in distance scale. They're very, very precise, and they agree very, very well with the prediction. But that's really just a tiny part of the prediction. Those three decades are only three out of 15 or 22 of decades of distance scale over which inflation predicts the matter power spectrum. And inflation predicts it to extend to vastly, vastly smaller scales than those probed by galaxy surveys. Here is another picture. This is a busy picture. I'm going to walk you through it in the remainder of the talk. Again, I told you that the matter power spectrum I showed you before is the process power spectrum. That little hook is the power spectrum. The primordial power spectrum is predicted to be something that's very, very close to flat and so that's very close to one. It's been measured very, very precisely over these three decades in distance scale. You can see that line goes right through those data points. But then we have a prediction that extends many, many orders of magnitude beyond what's shown here. For the lowest energy scale of inflation, it goes all the way out to here. For the highest energy scale of inflation, it actually goes to the right of this plot over here. And we have almost no constraints to that matter power spectrum on small scales. So the question that I'd like to address... Sorry, can I ask it? Sorry. Yep. Well, okay. so, like, when you get down to scales... That are too small, it's not inflation, right? It's geology, biology, right? I mean, if you're on centimeters or meters, right? So well, this is the primordial matter power spectrum. As far as we know, oh, intelligent so life. Stop life measuring life. today, this is what you would measure from. Yeah, the inflation, the prediction is actually for the. This, this is a prediction for the primordial matter power spectrum. Um, yes, lots of things happen. Right, well, that's why I was In the intervening time. So. The question I'd like to address in the remainder of the talk is how can we measure or at least constrain the primordial power spectrum over these you know, extra 12 to 19 um, orders of magnitude and distance scale? And everything I'm going to tell you here, here on in is futuristic. Some of it is you know, futuristic, but we'll live to see it. Some of it is completely beyond the pale. Some of it might actually happen even though there aren't active efforts right now afoot. So it's kind of an interesting question to think about. And what I will tell you about is a number of the ideas that people have discussed. 21 centimeter fluctuations from the dark ages, supernova lensing dispersions I'll tell you about. I'll tell you about spectral distortions in the CMB, primordial black holes, and then um, things that we can, ways we can search for ultra-compact mini-halos, dark matter mini-halos that might arise from the small-scale power. So from here on in, it's going to go quite rapidly, and I will do the best I can to make it understandable. So 21 centimeter fluctuations are the easy, are the first. So this is a picture of the universe as we observe it from this bow over here. As we look out to larger and larger distances in the universe, we see the universe as it was at earlier and earlier times, because lights from more distant objects takes longer time to get to us. So when we look at that cosmic microwave background, we're looking at a distance or redshift of 1100. And the first stars, we believe, formed somewhere around the redshift of 10. We don't know exactly, maybe somewhere between 7 and 13. But in between the time at which those cosmic microwave background photons last scattered, which is when electrons and protons first combined to form hydrogen, and the formation of the first stars, the baryonic matter in the universe, which at that time consisted almost entirely of hydrogen and helium, was um, atomic gas, atomic hydrogen. And so if I look at a cosmic microwave background that passes through that atomic hydrogen, photons in that cosmic microwave background at frequencies that match the 21 centimeter spin flip transition in hydrogen can be absorbed. And so people have actually proposed, and people are actually starting to look for 21 centimeter absorption in the cosmic microwave background that arises from this neutral hydrogen during these dark ages. So if we can make these measurements, we can start to map the distribution of matter um, 
in the universe at these times. Yep. This implies something about the temperature because if the temperature is high, then you wouldn't see any absorption. Uh, absorption yeah. So the temperature, the cosmic microwave background at redshift 1100 decouples from the gas. And then the temperature of each, each photon has a wavelength that expands with the universe. And so the temperature of the photon gas drops as one divided by the scale factor of the universe. Whereas each atom in the gas has a momentum, which is, uh, has associated with the Compton, uh, sorry, the Broglie wavelength. The de Broglie wavelength of each atom decreases one over the scale factor, but the kinetic energy is p squared over 2m, and so the kinetic energy decays is 1 over a squared. So after the photons decouple, the gas gets, becomes colder. And it stays colder until stars form, and then it gets reheated. So we are talking about absorption in that regime. So this is a very active area of investigation, and what I will tell you about this is um, brief. I told you that, lots of neutral hydrogen there. So um, this is a paper by, a graph from a paper by Loeb and Zaldariaga from about um, five years ago, ten years ago, I don't remember exactly, in which they calculated the angular power spectrum of this neutral hydrogen absorption. And the physics of this neutral hydrogen is fairly simple as is the physics of the cosmic microwave background. So the important thing here is that this power spectrum extends up to L, multiple moments of about 10 to the 6, whereas the cosmic microwave background power spectrum gets damped at L of about above 10, of, of about 1,000. So in principle, you can actually access three additional orders of magnitude and distance scale if you can do these 21 centimeter absorption measurements. So those measurements will take us from over here, three orders of magnitude to the right. Yep? I have a general question. So you mentioned early on that there are various kinds of nuclear theories that suggest that there's some kind of behavior that can Oh, you mean apart from this matter power spectrum? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's what the, the other. That's the other talk I was going to give you. <laughs> and Ramon can give you another talk too. Oh. Yeah, that's a good question. So, the Big Bang was a long time ago, and very far away, and. Um, you know, to many people, the origin of the universe is an interesting question. So if you're one of these people who's interested in the origin of the universe, um, you have to be prepared for disappointment. Because, you know, fossils from that time are few and far between. And so the, the point of the field is sort of to try to do whatever we can. And some of what we've done is sort of searching under the lamppost. But in order to make progress, we have to find new lampposts to search under. And this is one of them. Another thing that I was going to talk about is polarization of the cosmic microwave background, the search for B modes, which we thought we found last year, and then turns out we didn't. Um, there are also things in the um, characteristics of the perturbations beyond the matter power spectrum. So the matter power spectrum, as I showed you, is the variance, or the two-point correlation function for primordial perturbations. Inflationary models also make predictions for the three-point correlation function. And Roman is one of the world experts on how to infer things about the early universe from measurements of the three-point correlation function. So this is a, uh, just one thing I'm going to focus on that people have not paid a whole lot of attention to in the past. Yep? Um, so it turns out that, um, I don't have a good picture of this, I'll draw it. So the cosmic microwave background blurs out structure on small scales. So the reason is that when we look in a given direction, we see a cosmic microwave background that lasts scattered over here. At very early times, the photon mean free path was very short. But what happens, around this time, is electrons and protons start to combine. The free electrons that scatter the photons disappear, 
And so the photon mean free path becomes long, and ultimately, you know, very long. But this is the last scatter. But before the last scatter, there was a second to last scatter. And that second to last scatter takes place when the mean free path is becoming large. So the second to last scatter typically comes from some distance like that. <clears throat> and so this tends to blur out any structure. The second to last scattering blurs out any structure on scales smaller than roughly five arc minutes, which corresponds to an L of roughly 1,000 over here. Whereas the gas retains, um, the gas distribution retains the, the same distribution. The pressure in the gas is extremely small. And it's actually that very small pressure that then gives rise to the suppression at L about 10 to the 6. <clears throat> so, um, another thing that's been discussed, and um, there's actually another paper about this by these people just within the past few days, <clears throat> is supernova lensing dispersion. So a supernova is an exploding star. It blows up, and to a first approximation, every supernova has the same brightness. And then we look at a supernova. Sorry, it has the same luminosity, and then the ones that are very faint, we infer are far away. The ones that are bright, we infer are close by. So suppose we had a whole bunch of supernovae that were all at exactly the same redshift, say one, the same distance. They should all have exactly the same brightness. But inflation predicts that there should be fluctuations in the matter density. And if there are fluctuations in the matter density, those matter fluctuations can give rise to a gravitational potential that, according to general relativity, will distort the trajectories of photons. And so there will be a gravitational lensing blurring of the objects and actually a gravitational lensing dispersion in the distance that we infer. So if the universe was perfectly smooth, every supernova at a given redshift would have exactly the same brightness. But if there are matter fluctuations, that will give rise to, fluct to some dispersion about this, the, the, the average value. So these are measurements of supernova distance, supernova brightnesses as a function of the redshift or the distance. And there's some scatter, and we believe that that scatter is primarily measurement. But you can look at this, and you can see that there's an upper limit to the scatter. And from that upper limit to the scatter, we can infer an upper limit to some integral of the dispersion of the matter density in the universe. And so these people have claimed that you can come up with an upper limit to the matter power spectrum on small scales. So that's why I said here. Gravitational lensing by small scale and homogeneities give rise to dispersions. <coughs> And so they claim that such techniques can get up to roughly a comparable distance scale as 21 centimeter fluctuations. Yep? Um, just as a sort of sanity um, check, at what point along this wave under axis do you hit size scales so small that the relation theory doesn't make sense anymore? I mean, you know, oh. tiny things. So in the early universe, um, it's all, the, the amplitude is, um, so after inflation, the amplitude is everywhere small enough that um, its uh, perturbation theory works. Yeah. So actually, I I don't know whether so these so these guys have actually come up with an upper limit, and I didn't show it because I'm not sure if I trust it because of exactly that issue, which I can discuss more afterwards. Uh, for this measurement, I think um, all the way over here, this entire thing. For the 21 centimeter, for the 21 centimeter, the linear theory should be should be fine. The other complicated thing that I studied is that there actually there are trends where the scatter depends on the galaxy in which the supernova went up. So we have lots of discussions about that in the Yep, as I said, it's an upper limit. Upper limit, everyone believes. Yeah, but it's an upper limit that will probably never get. Well, I don't know. We'll have to see. Never is a... It's never good to say never. <laughs> but, it, but taking more... But, but taking more precise data on each supernova or getting more supernova, you know, without understanding supernova better, won't make it better. It's not just like, you know, I don't know Maybe. Yeah, because if you have lots of data, you can just choose to observe, you know, only include those in certain galaxies. You don't have certain... You don't have that. 
So food for thought. So the next thing I will discuss are spectral distortions in the cosmic microwave background. Um, this is an area or subject that's actually taking off quite a bit. Over the past few years, a number of theorists in the CMB community have started to give this very serious thought. So the idea is the following. <clears throat> the cosmic microwave background has a frequency spectrum that's extremely close to a black body, to roughly one part in 10 to the fifth of a black body. It's measured very, very precisely. And a black body is achieved by photons when they come into thermal equilibrium. And thermal equilibrium here has two parts. It has kinetic equilibrium, it implies kinetic equilibrium, and it implies chemical equilibrium. So kinetic equilibrium is the distribution that will arise if photons can scatter elastically, in such, but scatter in such a way that the number of photons remains fixed. So the most general photon frequency spectrum that is in kinetic equilibrium will be not a black body, but will be a Bose-Einstein distribution with some value of a chemical potential mu. If the photon number can change, if photon number changing interactions like Bremsstrahlung occur rapidly enough, then that chemical potential will come to zero and the photon gas will achieve also thermal equilibrium, which is a black body, which is a Bose-Einstein distribution with mu equals zero. Now, if I take two different black bodies, or two black bodies with a different temperature, and add them together, the resulting frequency spectrum is not a black body spectrum. It is a slightly distorted black body spectrum, and the, the distortion has a particular functional form with some amplitude, um, y, and it's called the Compton y distortion. Okay, so two black bodies, black, black bodies with two different temperatures. I add them, I get another distribution that is a Compton Y distorted black body. So actually, when I look at the cosmic microwave background in the sky, I told you there are temperature fluctuations of one part in 100,000. If I average over those temperature fluctuations, I will actually have a Compton Y distortion of roughly one part in 100,000, a little smaller. <coughs> If photons can elastically scatter and come into kinetic equilibrium, but the photon number remains fixed, then, as I said, we result we will end up with a, a Bose-Einstein distribution with a, some non-zero chemical potential. So, it turns out that in the expanding universe, at redshifts less sorry greater than ten to the six, so when the universe was um, smaller than one one millionth of its current size, or when the temperature of the cosmic microwave background was greater than a million times its current temperature, um, photon number changing interactions occur very rapidly compared with the expansion. And so if I do anything to heat the cosmic microwave background, that heat gets completely thermalized. If, however, I heat the gas at a redshift great, less than 10 to the 6, Photon number changing interactions become slow compared with the expansion of the universe, and the photon number remains constant, and so the heat that's transferred into the photon gas gives that photon gas a chemical potential distortion. So if anything were to happen in the early universe to heat the gas at redshifts less than 10 to the 6, that heat will induce spectral distortions in the cosmic microwave background. So this is a, a, an overly busy plot I should remake it. This is the universe today. This is looking back in time. At very early times, redshift greater than 10 to the 6, as I told you, um, heating the, therm the gas gives rise to no thermal distortion. In some um, range of redshifts, less than 10 to the 6, but greater than a few thousand, the heating of the gas gives rise to chemical potential distortions of the cosmic microwave background. At later times, if I heat the gas, the photon scattering takes place <clears throat> so slowly that I actually don't redistribute the photons at all, and I just wind up with, um, with uh, different black bodies, or in other words, a Compton Y distortion. So if I heat the gas at very early times, there's no distortion to the black body. During this redshift regime, I create a chemical potential distortion. At late times, I create a Y, Compton Y distortion. At intermediate times, there's some combination of mu and Y distortion. So if I measure the 
frequency spectrum of the cosmic microwave background, I can infer something about, and I find some distortion, I can infer something about when that cosmic microwave background was heated. So it turns out that there is a source of heating that arises from this matter, the, these primordial matter fluctuations. So this is a plot of the cosmic microwave background power spectrum that we actually observe. So it has these peaks. As I said, it damps away at L of a few thousand. This damping, which I sort of described over here, it's called silk damping after Joe Silk. Roughly speaking, the silk damping arises because I have these um, matter oscillations. In the early universe, <coughs> there are baryons that are tightly coupled to photons, and so the early universe is filled with a, a plasma that has a non-zero pressure. So these matter fluctuations in the early universe actually propagate as acoustic waves in the photon baryon fluid. But as <coughs> the mean free path of the photons becomes large, the viscosity of that photon baryon fluid becomes large, and if I have an acoustic wave propagating through a gas that has some viscosity, those acoustic waves will dissipate. Those acoustic waves actually carry some energy, just like you know the sounds in my voice, just like my voice does in this room. So that energy in those acoustic waves winds up heating the primordial gas. And whether I get a chemical potential, sorry, a spectral distortion of the frequency spectrum of the cosmic microwave background or not depends on when those, um, when that dissipation occurs. The calculation is straightforward but complicated, but roughly speaking, we forecast that measurements of cosmic microwave background distortions in the future should be able to probe primordial power over the, this, this range of wavelengths between k of 1 and 10 to the 4th. So some of this overlaps with what we might learn from 21 centimeter fluctuations, but some of it actually extends to slightly higher k. So these are things that people are discussing and taking seriously, but it is still somewhat futuristic. But I would say futuristic, say, you know, in a lifetime or a few decade time scale futuristic, not, you know, futuristic like we'll have to discover intelligent life elsewhere that's figured out how to do this before we have. Um, what, what, is, like, what kind of upper limits are uh, That's tricky. We're still trying to figure it out. Um, it depends on what you assume about the various... Um, Models. I don't think that the so the most ambitious project is Prism that people have discussed, and I think that that would start detecting power, say up to you know ten to the minus four ish. We're not going to get precise measurements. What we'll get is our constraints. I think we'll be able to, to to tell that the the matter power spectrum doesn't diverge wildly. Um, then there's dissipation on smaller scales. So this frequency cutoff, sorry, this K cutoff arises because modes that have very small wavelengths will dissipate um, during the time that the, the, the heat just gets completely thermalized. But what we showed in this paper is that even if that heat gets completely thermalized, if it happens around the time of Big Bang nucleosynthesis, they might actually alter the predictions of Big Bang nucleosynthesis. The theory we have for the formation of the light elements in the universe a few seconds to minutes after the Big Bang. And so we believe with this that we might be able to get to even smaller scales. So this is the same as the previous plot that I showed you. Um, but it's plotted slightly differently. This is the primordial matter power spectrum as a function of K. Um, this is sort of the theoretical prediction. Cosmic microwave background large scale structure gets very large scales. These Compton, these um, spectral distortions probe these um, largest, larger scales. And we think that Big Bang nucleosynthesis, these Big Bang nucleosynthesis measurements can constrain primordial power on these smaller scales over here. This is a slide for Roman. Although it's written... Uh, <laughs> in words that everyone can at least read, if not understand. Um, some models for inflation predict that primordial perturbation should be non-Gaussian. So what I talked about with the matter power spectrum is the two-point correlation function. I showed you the prediction of inflation for the two-point correlation function. Some models of inflation predict that there should be three-point correlation functions that are non-zero. 
Or roughly speaking, what that, these models predict is that the wavelengths, the amplitudes of long wavelength modes might be coupled with the amplitudes of small wavelength modes. So here's an exaggerated picture of what this would imply. So suppose I have one long, wave, one long wavelength mode of the primordial density field. If there is non-Gaussianity, then the amplitude of small scale fluctuations could be big, where the amplitude of the long wavelength density perturbation is big, and then small, where the amplitude of the long wavelength density perturbation is small. So if this were to occur, then these small wavelength modes, which heat the primordial plasma and give rise to chemical potential sorry, to, to chemical potential or Compton Y distortion of the cosmic microwave background would be correlated with the long wavelength perturbation modes that give rise to the temperature fluctuation. So if this occurs, you would actually expect to see a correlation between um, the spectral distortion in some given region of the sky and the temperature. So if that is a hot spot in the universe, I would also expect to see a large chemical potential fluctuation. In a, hot, a cold spot, I would expect to see no or very small chemical potential fluctuation. So that's what's said. And then there are other things involving the thermalization of photons that I won't talk about. And then I have a number of slides which I probably won't have time to get through. The last thing that uh, people have thought about is galactic substructure, mini halos, mini halos and primordial black holes. So I'll just show you a few things um, to give you some flavor. So regions of high density in the early universe evolved to become gravitationally bound objects um, in the universe. So for example, uh, a galaxy forms from a primordial density perturbation that has a wavelength of roughly one megaparsec. A dwarf galaxy forms from a primordial density perturbation that has a wavelength of one-tenth of a megaparsec. And clusters of galaxies form from primordial perturbations that have wavelengths of 10 megaparsecs. And so, when I look at this matter power spectrum, this primordial matter power spectrum, the abundance of dwarf galaxies is determined by the power spectrum over here. The abundance of galaxies is determined by the matter power spectrum over here. The abundance of clusters of galaxies is determined by the matter power spectrum over here. But the matter power spectrum on these small scales determines the abundance of mini halos or substructures within a typical dwarf galaxy or galaxy halo. So these are difficult to map with galaxy surveys because all we can do with galaxy surveys is tell where the galaxies are. What we would like to do is determine the distribution of mass within an individual galactic halo. So a lot of people have given some thought to how you would determine the distribution of mass within an individual galactic halo. And this is actually a simulation of a dark matter halo. This whole thing is the dark matter halo for one Milky Way type galaxy. And the theory predicts that there should be tons of small little substructures. The abundance of these substructures is, is determined by the amplitude of that matter power spectrum that we'd like to determine on very small scales. So, um, I think I will skip this slide, but point out that a number of things have been discussed, a no number of empirical avenues to actually determining this substructure. The substructure is hard to see because it's substructure in the dark matter halo. We can't actually see it directly. It's dark. But there is an idea called gravitational microlensing. So suppose I have, suppose I look at some distant star, and suppose some small object like a black hole or some galactic mini halo passes along the line of sight towards that star. When that object gets close to the line of sight, it will gravitationally lens the background object, and this background star, which is you know so bright will become microlensed, and it'll become brighter. So you will see with time that the star becomes brighter and then fades away again when this um, small object passes away from the line of sight. What's the time scale for that? So it depends on the mass of the substructure. Um, a solar mass substructure in the galactic halo gives rise to an event of roughly three months. And These small... So, um, so microlensing has been observed, but due to stars. Um, we have not observed microlensing and, and black holes, stellar mass black holes, probably. We have not observed microlensing due to individual subhalos, except in a different um, 
in a different way um, in larger scales. So this has been discussed as a way to probe primordial power on small scales. Uh, there's also the possibility that if the star, sorry, the lens does not pass right along the line of sight, suppose it passes away from the line of sight, there will be some lensing effect still, but it will be weaker. And if you look at an individual star, another possible consequence of that lensing is that the star actually moves on the sky as the lens passes along the line of sight. And this is called astrometric microlensing, and there's a satellite now called Gaia that's measuring the positions of millions of stars very precisely, and people are actually looking at this with those data, looking for this with those data now. And then people have discussed a variety of ways to probe small-scale structure or look for these mini-halos through the um, products, annihilation products, of dark matter particles in those halos. So if the small-scale substructure is there, and if dark matter is composed out of the types of particles that um, Neo and I and others believe it might be made out of, then those dark matter particles, two dark matter particles in the substructure, could annihilate and produce something like gamma rays. So people do gamma ray surveys of the sky, and what you would wind up seeing are little bright spots from gamma ray annihilation in the sky. So there's another few more things I was going to discuss, but in view of the time, they're a little more technical, and I'll skip them. I will just close with one semi-related statement. So um, you asked before if there were other ways to look for other fossils from the early universe, fossils from inflation. So inflation, as I told you, predicts these primordial matter perturbations. It turns out that inflation also predicts that the universe should be filled with a stochastic background of gravitational waves. The prediction for the frequency spectrum of those gravitational waves is similar to that for the matter perturbations. The frequency spectrum of those gravitational waves is expected to be um, very close to a power law that extends over 15 to 22 decades in distance scale. And we now actually have ways to look for these primordial gravitational waves with the cosmic microwave background polarization. And last year we thought we had found those, and now we've realized we haven't yet. We're still looking. People are also looking for gravitational waves at much smaller frequencies, um, frequencies about close to 17 orders of magnitude smaller than sorry, higher, frequencies higher than those probed with the cosmic microwave background with direct satellite searches. The satellites the people that are on the drawing board now, well, satellites that are on the drawing board now have arbitrarily good sensitivity. Um, the ones that might actually be achieved, you know, in the next few decades probably will not have quite the sensitivity yet to detect the gravitational waves predicted by inflation, but at least in principle and perhaps in the not-too-distant future, there is a prospect to measure, um, to detect gravitational waves at very high frequencies and at very low frequencies. And again, if we can measure those, we can infer something about this, um, the physics that gave rise to um, those gravitational waves, something about the physics of inflation. So to summarize, I told you that the first slide was also going to be the last slide. Inflation makes this prediction. It's a beautiful prediction. It's been tested very, very precisely, but only over a very limited range. It's interesting to think about if we, how we might ever get to the, access this entire range of predictions. As I said, these are futuristic and semi-crazy ideas, but I think it's very important to think about them, to think how we can go further. And some of the ideas that people have come up with are shown here and are discussed. So thank you very much. Yep. Yeah. What, what can you falsify, I mean, sort of generally, by, by uh, like experiments? Um, I'm not going to say what you can falsify. Let me tell you what we have falsified. Over the past 15 to 20 years, we falsified um, cosmic strings, primordial bar baryon isocurvature models, isocurvature models, cosmic string models, generalized topological defect models, superconducting strings, um, explosion scenarios, I would, I would huge number. Yeah. 
so what can I falsify now, or what can I falsify no, in the ten what years would, or the future? Would these observations? Um, well, it depends what the results are. So, if we were to find that um, spectral distortions, if we were to find spectral distortions correlated with the temperature fluctuations, um, with an amplitude, um, you know, ten times bigger than what the theory predicts, then we would falsify the prediction. So, a point way, way above this. Yeah. Yeah. As I said, these are futuristic. The most, you know, the, the, the likeliest ones are probably 21 centimeter fluctuations in spectral distortions. And those are not, you know, in the next decade or two going to get down to this precision, but they'll start placing up the limits over here. So you would worry if they're way above. Yeah. That's right.